Okay, welcome to the pre-Thanksgiving PPT edition. Interesting market times, but nonetheless, market times that we can learn from. Let's zoom out here. If you guys can see my chart, give me a little shout out in the channel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. God, you know, sometimes, so I know my charts are crazy with these lines. So that's why the other day, I, if I still have it, is it this one that I did? If I want to see a specific pattern without my zones, I'll just go here and see if I saved it. Yeah, so I drew this chart and, you know, we kind of got caught up in the short term. We see this head and shoulders pattern here. I'm sorry, this inverse head and shoulders pattern. Uh, shoulder, head, shoulder, head, right? So the idea is that that's why I made this up call because if I made a sideways up call, the idea is that this thing might not have, this thing may have already played its its uh, congestion here. So I was willing to, with an up call, buy a breakout, which I did in real time. And the idea is that, you know, you know so if we just look at this pattern without zooming out, right? You might say, oh, well, then the second setup is the pullback continuation setup to the FIB ratio, which I drew. But remember, everything is based on the market context. And if we see what we're doing, we're literally just buying right in front of even a larger pattern. Right. So let me just get rid of that. We're, bu we're, we're buying. Yes, this is a nice pattern. But look, this pattern is much bigger and it's coming into the big picture intermediate term. Right. Ooh. Right. The big picture is bearish. If we just zoom out here and get rid of this. Right. But if we're just looking at the last week, we've been in a sideways range. Right. We had this attempted breakdown, a false breakdown, or you could even say this was an expansion of the range. But just on this micro level, there's this pattern. But it's almost like the call was up to sideways. Right. Because I had to see this in real time. Now, up got us off the open. That open drive off the open was the setup. And that was anticipated based on this head and shoulders pattern and the fact that it would most likely, based on this key reference area, spending time here magnetized to the next key reference area, which was on the other chart here you know, more specifically magnetized to this VPOC. Now, just to make it less cumbersome here, you see, I just drew, see the VP, the start of the, the actual VPOC is on this price level, 16589.47. I'm sorry, the 16605.05. And it just touches right there. So that's the zone. So once you have that, just not to, just to have too much clutter, you can just remove that guy. And then of course I have, I also have the same principle on the right, which is confirming it with the other, just slapping it on the right side here, as you can see the biggest nodes here. So once I saw this, it's like, it's like, it's not like I'm saying, oh guys, you have to buy this pullback, which I gave you the second entry in real time. But it's like, really, what's the upside to just catch this? Like, yeah, you had a little bit of time to scale, but it wasn't worth it because even above this balance breakdown zone, which I didn't even mark yellow, I marked red because it's, this is a balance breakdown area out of a one, two, three, four, for like a week long pattern, which is bigger than a two day pattern, you know? So we're two and a half now. So, you know, when you're betting on patterns and stuff, just think of the ebb and flow of everything and say, hey, I'm just gonna bet on the better pattern. So if you did take, that's why I says, if you take this, if at all, because I was like, man, you know, it's like, it's so hard to post this in real time. It's also a breakout entry. So it's, plus that up call was very aggressive anyway. An up call was very aggressive anyway. Now, after I made that call, it's like we had this conversation on the phone, Corbin and I. It's like, well, an up call is very aggressive, but in Thanksgiving, there could be this little joyish thing people buy or whatever. There's all this possibility. But really, you know, the sideways thing possibly already could happen. And, you know, it's not like it's not like if this thing had a nice wide double bottom on a 60 with an up call, I'm not going to buy that. You know, it's just that I was willing to just be a little bit more aggressive off the open because technically, if the low of the day is here and now I'm going to and I made a sideways up call, I just didn't get filled today. And that's okay. But I just, you know, my I was very strongly with an up. And I, I you can see me and Corby very rarely make up or down. Up means it just takes off. Very hard to have enough edges stacked to do that. And this was almost like a, a day where it's like, it's like, is it, it's not really sideways up and it's not really up, up. It's like up sideways. You know, it's like there's these days where it's like the sideways already happened. It went up and now it's in a bigger zone, vacuum zone. And now it can just sit in the middle of this high volume node in VPOC. You have the balance breakdown area here. And the VPOC is the initial resistance of blue, which is right here. So, you know, it's plus it's the weekend. And also, you know, there's this news event. You can see this news event happened right at two o'clock Eastern, right? When I said it, I, I, I give it in Pacific time, which is 11, but this is two o'clock Eastern. You just don't want to be in the market. Let's just zoom in a little bit. It's just boom, 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 chop, chop. It's like, you know, no need for that. You know, and also here's a really good concept, right? It's like, we talk about 
we, we, we talk a lot about trade location, a lot of sideways calls, sideways up, because most of the time the markets are transacting sideways. So we want trade location, aka we're fading against price to get in, right, a double bottom, double top, support resistance, whatever. But there's often times where we have to use momentum, but it's like, okay, so this was the momentum. I got in on momentum here, right? This was the second setup or whatever. This is momentum pullback continuation, expecting something to test, but really, you know, testing, buying right in front of this is not good. Now, with that momentum still at this early enough in the time, if you did get at that Fibonacci, you at least could scale, you could hold, this didn't go back, you could get out more there. Not a great trade and really stressful. And then, of course, maybe if you moved your stop to break even, you got stopped out at this point, and that's fine. Now, at this point, you say, Matt, isn't this a pullback continuation, right? Pullback now, it's a deeper Fib level? No. Does anyone, do you want to know why? Because a pullback continuation setup requires momentum, and this time the momentum is dead. This is a fade setup that's very aggressive at pre-market support actually resistance that's now turned into support this yellow crap which i'll get into with i've been getting into with the color coding of them but the idea is that yes okay what you're saying you are using a fade setup at shitty trade location to get in on a bigger pullback continuation pattern but it's not a pullback continuation setup because the momentum at that point in time i don't even need to bring out the internals to confirm it Plus, we're talking about Bitcoin anyway. Sorry, I get flipped out because I'm doing two markets at once. Um, you know, you don't even need that, that to realize this is an aggressive because it's like the momentum's dead now. So just, just, just. Oftentimes, I just want to put that like once the pullback happens and it's dead, you're not. There is no real momentum now when it pulls back deeper into the day. It's kind of you know, especially now that it could peter out up here. But still, though. So what's happening though? I mean, maintaining structure, maintaining structure, and building a balance. This is healthy. You know, we didn't get a huge snap climax reversal down. Right. So let's zoom out. Right. And, you know, pop up. Right. We're now we're into. Right. This trend line, which is showing direction. Right. One leg, two leg, three, multiple legs down. Right. Double bottom, bounce, breakout, bounce, breakout, one. Leg. And so now we're like up here. Now it's like we're getting more questionable. Right. Right. But this little bounce breakout pattern and holding, this is bullish. Right. I mean, because if we do break this structure on good momentum and volume, right, we have this, you know, we're going to, we have this right at the middle of this low volume. No, we got this 200. Right. And then we have this is the real area you can magnetize to. So breaking this, I'm, bull, you know, a couple of days breaking that, I'm neutral bullish up here. It's more neutral. You can even turn neutral bearish if that's giving you that confirmation. But, you know, as of right now, um, it is Wednesday, the 23rd. So, you know, we just have to be very careful because it is Thanksgiving and there's going to be lower volatility. And, you know, that's why this was pretty aggressive um, of a call. Actually, let's go to, sorry, here we go. Sorry about that. I flipped out. We we're doing the open drive off Bitcoin and I flipped to the ES. I'll get into why that was sideways up. But, um, you know, you can see here, this was pretty aggressive because, you know, this wasn't really a bullish engulfing pattern. We didn't get quite up into it. But if you go on the smaller time frame at the hourly, you could see that there was enough time uh, here that this congestion could have played out, right? It's not as if we wouldn't, if it went deeper with a wider double knob, not get in. But, you know, it just so happens that it broke out and that was the momentum setup. Now, when you're doing this on a smaller time frame, this is that volatility stuff I talked about. You really got to have the utmost focus and watch this. And it's like, you know, as it's driving, you just feel it, you buy it, right? You don't want to buy it up after that, the, the drive's open, right? It's And you're getting in. And, and, and this is a quick, you know, this is, happens very quick. This is like, we were waiting all day for two 300 point ranges and chops, and all of a sudden it moves two through 400 points in a couple minutes here. So that's why you have to get him. So the volatility stuff wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't need to put it below the low of the current day, which would be here, right? To invalidate this and take, you know, a couple hundred stop, which would be kind of wide. If you do, if you have a calculator right now, let's say you put a stop at like 16,132 to give it a little bit of room, but you got in at 16,280, at 16,130, it's 280 minus 130, that's like 150. If you take 150 and divide it by 16,132, yeah, I mean, it's it's 0.9%, but it's like, why why would you risk 0.9? Just because you just because there's a fixed percent risk model with a certain max, which is technically a 2% risk rule, max, but really you have to have a little bit of a nuance here because like, would you really want to risk 0.9% on that when really, right? Because the fixed percent risk rule, which is against the Martingale, hey, let's double down when we're down and actually reduces your position size when you're down because it's fixed. So it frees up your mental real estate. But the idea is that the stop actually has to invalidate your trade thesis. So it doesn't have to always be like, oh, I have to have it at the biggest one ever just to have that room. Now it feels good in this environment, but really ask yourself, if I'm trading momentum breakout candle, 
right? Well, why would I need to put the stop behind the low of the day when I should put the stop behind the invalidation point, which is the actual breakout bar itself? So the, you use the volatility stop, it would be below the breakout bar. Now you have a really tight stop because you're catching it here. I mean, you know, this is something you can bet on. It's a lot smaller than 0.9%. And still, we're, we're thinking about risk reward with that cap, but not necessarily always taking that cap because sometimes we can get in. Like, look at Corby. Corby's like has a fixed percent, two percent rule, but his average is a half a percent. Now, I, I assume that's before fees or, you know, because if you add fees onto it, it's a little bit more. So I'm always like, well, I want to be well under percent because fees add onto it. That's how I think, you know. I, I I'd rather take a two hour stop and take two chances to get in with a smaller stop. Then take just an artificially wider stop because it feels good because I don't want to feel like a loser. Now, if you screen yourself out that and think about your stop loss first, it, it really takes out a lot of bad trades. So if you think about the stop and target first, you're honoring the risk idea first because your main job is to protect your capital and stay in the game. You can't trade if, you, if you're out of the game. So that was one why, reason why I was aggressive. We didn't quite have uh, a bullish engulfing, but it was a piercing pattern enough. But it was sort of a, this wide double bottom, right, that was happening after we've had major exhaustion, right? We didn't have this action reaction up, but we had a divergence in the CCI. We were going into the holiday weekend, and I just thought it was going to quickly gap up to that next high volume node based on that conjection, that smaller time frame pattern, and the piercing pattern in the larger time frame. Was it aggressive? Yeah. Very aggressive. And, and it's one of those setups that we always talk about, like, you know, we don't want to wait for confirmation on the fade setup because the low of the day is giving you the price point. You put it in to watch it hit again. Right. Or if you're watching in real time, you could look at the tick and do some more nuanced things and then know it. But it's like the price point is that. But with momentum, you know, you you don't have that luxury. You have to. So and that's why, you know, a lot of these prop firms, they want their guys to be doing momentum-based setups because it's just easier to find it. It's a lot harder to take the fade-based setups, which take a little bit more skill-based market context readings. And the fade-based setups are, they're easier and they're more successful. They are just more successful. There's more fading opportunities than momentum opportunities. Simply because there's more sideways days than trend days on average over a large sample size because there's more transacting in a market than rejection or accept, you know, because when they go sideways, there's relatively price acceptance and that's the main purpose of a market. And if they reject the price and trend, it's uh, pushing it away. It's rejecting the price and finding it in search of a new value area. So if the main purpose of a market is to facilitate trade, you can see why even just looking at this chart, even in, uh, you know, Bitcoin breaking lows and breaking lows, you know, it doesn't just go straight down. We have quite a few days here of, of going sideways and then the longer it goes sideways it breaks out so thinking like that helps um it helps the pattern now i'm not it doesn't mean that we, we're going to stay you know like i said especially for the es now we'll switch over to the es context real quick which i was not up i was sideways up and this one was a little different and this is because our sideways and we already had a huge move the day before for and it didn't have time to rest. I mean, this thing was just pure trend. I mean, it, it 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 was like Kobe said, it was a creep up market. And you know, once you have the once we have these rules double top, double bottom, and you get more skilled, and you know, it, and you have the time to put in the hours in front of the computer to scan it, you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to bed. Here's a double top, double bottom, which you can. I mean, you do miss setups. Like you know, here's an order I put on that had to take off. It just didn't hit. You know, now this was at what time was this? This was at 1940. This was at 2235. So a lot of the guys like Corby three hours earlier than me, that makes a big difference. A lot of the shorts have been happening in these low, low rotations when it's getting later at night for me. And I'm up very early, like four or five in the morning. So anything past nine, sometimes I'm up to, to midnight, but sometimes I just crash and miss these. And I'm like, okay with that. But you know, these are these are great opportunities. But it doesn't mean like, okay, now I'm in this and this, I have to take this one mechanically. Because you have to think about okay, what are the probabilities now? And that's where you know you you know, the daily call filters the plan from the top-down hierarchical approach because we want to be in alignment with the institutions where the bigger patterns are happening on these time frames. But at the same time, we don't want to be married to our call because we want to take in the real-time data when we get it. But it's like that's when you start to become, you know, but but really what an amateur does or a less sophisticated strategy would be totally swayed by the real-time data. And that's where that daily call takes that out. But that doesn't mean once it's in now with these skills that I'm teaching you, in addition to it, we're just arbitrarily going to take it every single time uh, completely systematic because there's this discretionary element of too, because otherwise we wouldn't need to be watching it real time. And your hit rate will go up. Right. But it, so, I mean, let's say you put like it was at this time of the day, 
you said, oh, I don't want to get that, but you know, it's at the, you see this green line here with the top problem, problem. Like, okay, I'm going to put an order there. I'm going to put a 10 point, whatever stop that would get me 66, at 76, whatever. So, you know, anytime I'm putting in a stop and I can get eight to 10 points and the stop is near next zone, that's great. That's giving you edge, especially if it can be like on it or behind it. I'm not saying you had to take this, but just to say you took this double top. There you go. Now, here's your next double top, high of the days in. Now, I was, I, was, I was giving this one in real time. I said, listen, now this one, if you took this on a purely systematic approach, you would realize, okay, I don't care if this was a loss because I'm, I'm risking X and I got more out of it and over a large sample size, you know, a 50% hit rate with a two to one. You don't have to have an 89% uh, hit rate in seven to one or whatever. You know, that's it's different levels, but think about it, 50% two to one, you'd want to flip a coin every time because, you know, 50-50, I'm going to make two bucks. Great. I lose, I lose one buck. Short term, if you have a 10% stop loss, you will, it is not, it is, I will guarantee you over a thousand trades, you will blow your account. Even though a 50% hit rate and a two to one risk reward ratio is a winning strategy. It's just that you might get unlucky over a short term and flip hit, tails 10 times. Tails is the loss, heads is the winner. You, you know, you can flip a coin right now. You might get unlucky and flip that and get 10 tails in a row. And if you bet 10%, you're done. Any trading service or educational component that talks about position sizing at a 10% or even a six, I mean, it's just, you don't have a lot of chances. How do you even let a winning strategy play its probabilities out? I knew, you know, I, I knew some strategies that I was uh, subscribed to were going to be done right away when the first stop loss was 6%. And the other one I was subscribed to was 9%. And I said, this is criminal. Uh, it just doesn't play out. You, the thing about the law of average is we're in this for the long game. Even we have to, you know, think, even though we have a lot of chances, we we're, we're also have, a, have to have an investment mindset. Like, let's get the sample size over a year. You can't let that play out if, you, if, if it's too big of a, a stop size. So this one in real time, with the tick, with the fact that it consolidated here and some other reasons that I mentioned, I did a scale. I said, the only thing going for this is trade location. It's not great low trade location. You're literally at the top of the zone that we've been penetrating. And really this is, this. is these are the next zones up here. This this is sort of like almost invalidated back and forth, back and forth. It's really not substantiating it much. Because, you know, the first test of it provided the best odds of a reaction and that was a while ago. So I said, hey, this one is more likely to break for all these reasons. So that's that scale. When you think about that probability scale in real time, you can think about, okay, what's for it, what's against it. And you certainly, you know, just because you have a feeling that this is going to break, it doesn't mean you want to buy a breakout here. Why? Because it's like, well, hey, the trade location is awful. You're buying at the high of the day, aka we don't do that. And a bunch of other reasons. There wasn't enough momentum. You're in front of resistance. What are the odds of a trend, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not something maybe you want to do over a large sample size of trades, even if it might work out that one time. You know, that's that's what we have to think about. And in this case, you know, in hindsight, let's say you did break this out. If you didn't scale, you would have got stopped out, you know? So um, I think on this day, what did I say when the market opened? Yeah, okay, so basically what happened was on this day, you have to, Think about what are the odds now based on the price structure and the new data that we have. Once like the daily call, I had this much data zoomed out. I'm not going to look at this chart. And now when the market opens, I have real quick. Right there. I have this much data. Right, so we have to always take in the new data. Right, so basically what I showed at this time with this much data is that if we zoomed out and, and the short-term neutral bullish bias was to, was to take its effect, this wasn't this is uh, actually this is a bad chart to do it because it's on the 60, but I actually posted a chart of this. This purple line was as an inflection point, which is if you zoom out, you'll see that it hits multiple time frames. So I said, okay, if we can stay above this zone at 3965 here, uh, the bulls can continue onward. Real quick here. And if anyone has any questions right now, please uh, let me just drop that. Phone.
Okay. Yeah. So 3965 here, right, is a, a, a high volume node. So if I zoomed out and use that indicator, it snaps this specific price level and it's within this green zone, which was a general area, a reference area. You know, you don't want your zones to be, you know, you want your zones to be within the parameters of, you know, the market you trade. So I'm not going to have like a, you know, a 50 point zone if the ranges are 80 points. This is uh, 56 to 6. This is pretty wide for me. This is like 10 points. But you can play defense, right? The back of the zone, we've got it for shorts, front of the uh, bottom of the zone for the longs. And of course, within the parameters of those daily calls and the, you know, the, like they said, the, 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 the lowest risk where I would say the easiest entry with the highest hit rate, if you can identify it in the certain environment would be that wide double bottom on a 60 minute time frame. It's a much easier setup. And if you're patient for it and only trade that setup, that's, that's fine too. You don't have to take every single trade. Welcome, welcome. Kobe, if, if you're, I can't hear if you're speaking. Let's see, oh, let me ask to unmute him. You wanted me to be unmuted? Oh yeah, I thought maybe you were you were trying to talk. I was just checking. No yeah, worries. I, I, mean, I can keep going. I, I, I know when to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just telling him about that. Uh, it was an aggressive call uh, with that up, and some of the reasons why maybe it wasn't the best idea. But you know, if, it wasn't out of the ballpark. We had already congested. But then I was just I was showing him on this chart. I said, yeah, there was this head and shoulders pattern. Let me get. For this real quick. Oop, there was this head and shoulders pattern, uh, uh, but I said, let's not get super focused with like, a, you know, saying, hey, blue car syndrome, this is the only pattern and saying this has to break up now because if we zoomed out, it was, you know, this break off the open was momentum, but then it's going up into this high volume node here, which is a bigger pattern and it might just, just go sideways, especially with the holidays for a while. So it was, uh, it was an aggressive aggressive call but it, then i was thinking hey what are, what are these calls where it's just like goes it blasts up and then it just goes sideways um if you made a sideways up here you put the you put your uh low of the day in here you just don't get in that's fine you don't have to hit everyone it's going a smaller time frame that's fine too because uh you know let's just say i made that up call and it didn't take off relatively soon, but then it did con congest here for a while. And then if we zoomed out on the hourly, it made something like this. Let's just say kind of, instead of just taking off on the hourly, kind of like, you know, and then a couple hours go by and then another one. It's like, you know, that's, that's a while. I would still take that on an up call because it still would be within this idea of this short-term strength continuation. But I would still say, hey, I got to play really good defense because just because I see, you know, that's where traders get into the mistake. They say, hey, I see an inverse head and shoulders pattern, bullish. And they get this, right? But it's like, well, what's above it? What's going on? What's the story? Okay, that pattern's this pattern, smaller than that pattern. I'm overall going to bet on the bigger pattern of who's going to, you know, win out in the short term, at least. You know, it's it's they're going back and forth now. So... It also depends on <clears throat> what kind of rules you have for the daily call. Because I, for example, I don't do intraday assessments. I do a daily call purely on everything that's on the daily, with the exception that I have two uh, stuff, two things that I also measure on the weeklies. So um, everybody has basically a different daily call because you looking through the looking glass of the future with the tools that I am most comfortable with. <clears throat> and for me, it was a sideways call. 
and the side was called based that the strongest abnormality uh, was two things. We had the minutes. So I, th I said, there's no commitment prior. That makes me a sideways day. And the, um, the, the tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So I'm training half size only anyhow. If you look, can you go back to the 60 minute chart, chart please? If you look at the 60 minute chart and you made a sideways call, and you have two nice shorts from the top that are prior to the job situation of, of the news. Because nobody is going to go for a trend day before, uh, before a major news item where everybody is just waiting to go into the car after the news item also to, to beat traffic to, to grandma's house rather do the turkey tomorrow. So if you, if you zoom a little out, please. This is in, I need out. Uh, no, you're right, of course. I need in, you're going out, so my mistake. Sorry about that. Um, then you see the the first double top with the two wicks. You have a nice move from uh, 16,600 down to 16,350. And this is actually the cleanest move. Because these exhaustion moves, are, where do you get in? If you buy the open on a trend day, then it basically says there's this immediate urgency that because a pure trend day, you want the whole thing right away. Um, and that works. You buy the open, and then comes this thing, breakout trading, I don't do. So as, again, this is all, uh, this is not a correction, by the way. His call was obviously absolutely right. We were somewhere at the lows of 16,200, and uh, we went all the way 500 points up and trading a little bit below uh, the highs, so to say. So nothing wrong with that call. And that's that's the biggest part out of all, if you would move that, that hand away so we could fix. Um, that's the great thing that I built in the general structure of the daily call is you cannot get into trouble. And that's the same thing with whether you would have made a sideways call because you can make it's not really a call that comes out that says sideways to down or down. So you're left with three calls sideways, sideways up, um, or up. So did you make money with the up call? Yes. Did you get in trouble with this? No, you get a first retracement if you would have bought that, get another winner because it gets financed to the highs or higher. Um, and then it's invalidated as soon as you get the second retracement lower. So in worst case scenario, and it would be unlikely that somebody takes that trade right before the news. You have two winners and one of them is a substantial one uh, and one small loser because all you do is buy the next retracement and you already got a double top so it's actually it's invalidated but let's let's just say with the trading area you have one large winner one small winner and one small loser that's for the trend day call if you did a, a sideways call then you get uh, these two shorts let's say one short because the other short is like the spike uh, up into the new, maybe not so much, but you get a nice, and that's, uh, as I said, 600 to, um, whatever, 400 in worst case scenario, but it's a clean move. So no troubles there. Um, so the, the great thing that they call is, is that you're not getting into trouble and that's the most important part. That's that's literally subliminal. That's not a, on an obvious front, but that's why that's why it's an instruction of what not to do versus what to do. And that's why uh, it's categorized in these most important five categories. You can make a seven or a nine call two where you, where you would make substructures of... Uh, how you get into the daily call, meaning is it a sideways up in a counter-directional or, or, or the sideways or in a directional way. 
Um, and you can make it as refined as you want to do it. So it doesn't have to be just like five, six, seven edges. You can also have like 20 edges in there that you stack. It, it just has to be that way that they're measurable. Um, just to elaborate one more time, that is very sensitive to do these things. And uh, how you do them is also not, not affecting it in a, in a negative way, because as I said, I don't do intraday what, what uh, um, Matthew just explained, but it obviously makes absolute sense when you say, well, I have an inverse head and shoulders, um, I have a congestion, I have a, so if, 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 you, if you have in your rule book all these uh, intraday uh, examination rules, that's just fine as well. It, it's just in the general principle structure where you have to be authentic. So it shouldn't be an, extract, shouldn't be an instruction of what to do that you feel forced into trades. It, it has always to be just that you avoid the losers. So that the rule is the important, the important part of the rule is what not to do. Thank you for your room, Matthew. Yeah, um, exactly. Thank you. And it just illustrates that whether you, if you made the up call or if you, you thought it was sideways or any one of those calls, there was there was opportunities because it uh, all those calls have certain rules that will prevent you from just making a complete, uh, okay, I'm going to buy somewhere in the middle of the zone or maybe someone has a psychology where they... They look at something that's confusing, and instead of making a decision based on X, Y, Z, they say uh, "fuck it" and they press the button. I know, you know, there's a possibility, for, you know. So this filters all that behavior because really, you're, it's not on you; it's on this system. It's on the system, and that's why uh, you know back testing the day and paper trading for testing is so important before you uh, risk real money on this to prove to yourself and your own psychology that it works. Let me add something to the yep. to the fuck it rule. So there's, a, <laughs> there's an anti fuck it rule. It's really important. Um, uh, it's also principle based. Everybody should have that. Um, I have an execution pad where I only have where I basically just have one button that's uh, not allocated. But let's say you you're a mouse kind of guy. Um, designate on your uh, somewhere on your desktop, somewhere on your screen, um, a little spot, a market. You can either do this just really silly with uh, a little mini post-it that has a little hole in it uh, or um, use some software. Yeah. There's plenty of post-it software stuff out there. And release that energy, meaning you will always have energy built up. It's one of the biggest problems with trading, especially for exits, because now you're in a press situation where you have to act and um, stuff builds up. Let's say it's an exit where it's the end of the day. So you get you get forced now, knowing that you only have, let's say, five minutes left to, to clear the books. Maybe it's Friday, so you're worried. Maybe it's a day like a day where you like didn't have make a rule yet and you're like, Oh, do I have to get out because uh, this is tomorrow holiday? And stress builds up energy, physical energy in your brains. And it is absolutely typical that you seek for that release um, of that energy. And if you don't have an option, principle-based, rule-based built in where you as I said, I click on, on on a fake execution button that doesn't work, or you 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 look for that field uh, that it should be somewhere close to your to your enter button field, and you just click into the that empty screen. Then that click of a button will release that energy. Now your mind is free again uh, to think clearly. So it is exactly how Matthew described the uh, the fuck it move is a really bad move uh, when you're um, stressed, confused, uh, waiting for a long time for your trades. So it's actually worse to how this typically goes is you wait forever for that entry, you follow all your rules, but you expected this to happen in the next 15 minutes. Um, this is why I make these 
uh, screenshots into the room to release because that also releases it for whoever is observing where I make a trend line and then I say, okay, this is uh, a market snapshot. But you don't know how tight the triangle will be or how tight the, I mean, I'm pretty good with my entry timing. So typically every post that I have, about 98% of my posts is entry, either entries or exits. I just don't try to cause so much trouble to each time. So, oh, this is a trade. You should go, oh, 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 did you go out? Did you go in? Because that's not helpful. But I can obviously be, be wrong too, and I can be wrong by even an hour or two, because most of the time when you're wrong, it actually takes build up of the charts again that it's the next round, so it's a lot later. So now you're hawking and stalking, and it's late at night for, for me, often where lately where, the, where you need to place outside uh, main, main traffic hours, and um, uh, you just want to be done with it. You just want to be done with it. And as a progressed trader, you, of course, still manage the entry well. But then your exits are screwed because that energy is still not fully released. You, you just finance way too early or uh, the situation before with prior to tomorrow or prior on a Friday. You just cut your runners short. You're just like, ah, I want to be... A, I don't want to have to think about it any longer. I don't want to carry over the weekend. It's too much risk. Whatever you, you give yourself a quick reason, uh, and and then you're like, uh, it's really lousy. You can have like runners that go forever. And either way, for example, my LTC runner exit, where we then still have another fifteen percent the next day. And I looked back at the chart and thought, why did I already go out of here? There was no. There was a there was a small exhaustion in, in the double top overhead resistance zone on daily, um, but I realized that I made a trading error because my my whole family is sick, including me with the flu, so fever and whatever kind of should should rather be in bed, but always dedicated to the craft. And I uh, I also I just wanted to be done. Uh, I mean, not that we didn't have nice returns on that trade, but that that runner could have stayed in. And these empty buttons are really helpful for that. You can uh, also categorize these if you don't want to make up your mind, like you can you, you can write on, you can basically make this, as I said, this small post-it, make a slit into it so you can see the mouse underneath uh, and write uh, entry, exit, uh, half off and runner on this thing and then your request of your brain is to move actually to that line where you wrote this and to click that button. So it's not, it doesn't become too automatic. It, ha it also has to be basically a, a little bit brain challenging, just as an, a regular execution uh, would have to be where you have to adjust size or uh, press different buttons. Um, and this is working wonders. Um, another good thing is also get rid of that whole money thing. You don't want anywhere P and L. You don't. You always want to, to think in points and ticks. That's why I never say, "Oh, we made money on four contracts." This no. I always say, uh, "Okay, finance for 20, 25 or ODS or or whatever points or ticks, whatever instrument we're trading." Because as soon as you think in money uh, in a stressful situation. Um, what if you become a hedge fund manager and your thousands or ten thousand uh, dollar lots uh, turn into or a hundred thousand lots and you start oh I'm down three and a half times uh, what my house is worth and, and, and it becomes emotional so you will, you never want to think in, in in dollar amounts you want to you want to think in, in in tips and ticks and points. Um, these little, these little tricks, as uh, silly as they sound, uh, can save you years of um, wrong execution. I, I just posted this, this thought that I had today, uh, or I should say that thought that Matthew and I had in the conversation between each other yesterday, that trading takes this long time and one feels all the time behind because typically 
you open this fry stand, and when that fry stand runs well, then you cash it in, and uh, then you open a restaurant, and then you realize, oh, you need three restaurants because then you get uh, more wholesale or price competition. Uh, and, uh, and at the very end, you might become whatever, a food chain owner. No such thing in trading. Your food chain owner immediately, once you have a significant edge that you, that you can execute, and that compensates for human error, and, and you have the skill set. But there is no rewards in between, meaning you don't get uh, first to the regionals and, uh, and then to the Olympics and then to the NBA. You 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 either play with, uh, with Shaq or Neil or, or, or you, you're not even playing at all. You're just losing your last times of little bets to, to neighborhood kids. And in between is nothing. But... <clears throat> Thinking the whole thing really through is that self-development that is necessary to get to to uh, be a master in that skill is necessary and desired to end up when you make the money because um, money is just an expression of being able to express yourself more than you are right now. It, it, but it's the same person. So the flaws and the shortcomings and the self-sabotage and the, when you don't want to come out and just have a yacht and, uh, and then still just invite the hookers and cheat on your wife. That's not, that's not, that's not the goal. Uh, the goal to that freedom that we're all seeking and that independent uh, if you do just stupid stuff, it's just more painful. So in, in a way, training is a long, painful experience, but you're peeling yourself and your own closet ghosts to the point that you're ending up with both. You come out a nice person that we all are when we're coming to this planet that we just get overlaid through weird childhoods or whatever circumstances in life and uh, and have the money at the same time. So there is not this loss because lots of people think, oh my God, I do this for five years. I do this for 10 years. Uh, I should have spoke, I have to watch my education instead. I built three parallel careers. Yeah, well, you can trade till you're 95 years old. Uh, in which profession can, can you do that? And you at least when you when you're there and you make the money, you use that money for for good things uh, instead of just doing. I don't know. As I, as I wrote in that article that I posted, I don't know what the percentage was, but it was something crazy. I think it was over seventy percent in uh, in five years of lottery winners are uh, financially worse than before they got their millions. Just as a proof that I'm. That this is factual, what I'm talking about, because because all they do is express themselves more, but that doesn't mean that they have any skills at about money of how to uh, keep it wealth preservation or or how to just not become this endless drunken party person. And then you know, when the money is gone, you, you start coming to your senses again, <clears throat> because you need to learn to. to there should be a normal growth rate that that's provided in life in a normal way, but being excluded from something that is so powerful that tapping into massive energies flowing towards you that's uh, able in, in training. And once that's realized that these sufferings can be overcome more easy because you, you befriend the process much more than thinking outcome oriented of, oh uh, yeah, I want to be rich and yeah, I, I want to be independent and uh, don't work anymore and uh, live a life on vacation. Well, every, every, every vacation after four weeks is pretty boring too if you don't have somebody to share it with who obviously also needs a process of maturing if it's a healthy relationship and so on. So, um, this is all a little tricky, but this is all 
for those who seek certain challenges in life, an extremely positive um, process of self-development and an acquiry of a mastery that um, has one big advantage, which is that typically and that's also a very high percentage. People cannot reproduce um, their careers, uh, their, 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 their success. That's why all these retired dentists and doctors lose all their money in the, in the stock market because just because they were well studied and crafted uh, successful men doesn't mean that they're good in market play. And typically a career needs some luck. You just need some at the right time, uh, at the right place. And trading does not need that. It's in opposition to all people who think that you're gamblers. Once you're not gambling in the market any longer, luck has nothing to do with your success. There is absolutely clear defined edge that you play over and over again. And, um, What's a plenty for? Yeah, uh, you mentioned luck too. It's, I think before you came on, I was mentioning you could get unlucky. Let's say you're flipping a coin, you could get unlucky. You have a 50% hit rate, two to one, you could get unlucky over the first 10 flips and get 10 tails in a row. But over the long run, over 500 for the 1,000 flips, that's when the skill of your strategy takes place. Uh, and that's the only way you'll ever be able to reach that is to stay in the game long enough. And that's why you got to control your position sizes 100%. That's why we think about it in terms of risk to reward. And uh, it's got to be conditioning, actually, thinking about your stop and target first. Thinking about your stop and target first and doing a lot of counterintuitive psychological techniques has been really helpful. Um, prior to the last whatever week, there was a these uh, neutral days or these days where they would look like it would break to one side. And it's like, you couldn't really get in on a double bottom. And, and uh, Kobe and I were basically trying to fade these on first test. That's to do that. It, that requires a way different psychology than let's say a market where it's more stable on a pure, on a pure sideways where we're getting in on these. So a, you don't have to take all of these and B uh, you have to condition the right psychology to be able to take the trade setup that you're comfortable with. Um, so if you only take, hey, I'm only going to wait for a really wide double bottom, not even a double top, a wide double bottom in this type of environment, when maybe more time frames are aligned or what have you, I'm going to just get that 60 minute on that 60 minute chart. That's great. You'll scan for that target. And maybe that's where you need to start out. Because uh, as you get to different levels, there'll be you'll uncover holes. You'll think, oh, I got this in paper trading. It's got the 80-something percent here, right? This is easy. And then you open up your first account and you feel, you'll feel your first whatever on your first trade. You're like, oh, wow, this feels different when it's real money now. And then your unconscious money issues might come up. And you might say a couple of times, you know what? I don't like losing money. In fact, you know, at family dinners, my, our family's never even talked about money. And in, in fact, you know what? I don't even like money. I think it's evil. I might just say fuck it today and just give it all back. This is, I, I, I did this, guys. I don't even want to say how much, but it's uh, last November. Uh, don't don't make big investment decisions around deaths in the family. This because you're in whatever level you're at, there will be new things that will come up because the psychology of, of risk at different levels never, never ends. Uh, we're constantly growing and having to deal with different sides of ourselves that will come out. So this is why it's a, a real deep exploratory aspect of, of your unconscious that will come out. And like, really, no, it's not even this idea that, hey, I'm like a way, way better. It's not, I like I'm perfect or these things don't come up. It's like now I just say, hey, I recognize them now. Like, oh, I'm, this is this is this is uh, this is manifest now. This might lead to this behavior. I need to stop the engines and reframe some things now. So it's like, whereas before in that state, I would go make huge decisions, right? Euphoria, bull market, let's buy more. We all do, you know, now the brakes are counterintuitively put in place. So it's like the only way I could get to where I am, which was since May, a really, really solid performance and consistency and all routines and that the performance then follows itself is that I had to reframe pretty much even the major setbacks, pretty much every setback, right? was just a better learning opportunity. That's it. I embraced it. I moved forward. So I had to really integrate the fact that, and this is really where you can get your psychological edge that most 
people that start their trading journey, they hop from program to program. They never actually really trade on an account that could actually potentially give them financial freedom from their whatever job. It's because they don't under, they think this is easier than it is. And it's like, well, guess what? You guys should really integrate the fact that it's, you should be glad that it's hard. You should really understand that trading has a lot of harsh realities and many difficulties. And you basically have to welcome this fact because without it, the game would cease to exist. And that's why you're like, oh, wow. So is it challenging? Will it sting? Yes. But that's like, you just keep showing up all of a sudden the market will be like, oh, yeah, all right. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I can, I can show up here and reflect back to this with appreciation and gratitude and patience because it's a great opportunity. There's many opportunities that are low risk that allow me to get in. And that's really what we want. We have a question. Let's see in the channel. Yeah, Kevin's, Kevin's got to go. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Yeah. We've been going for about an hour. Hey, Kobe, uh, we have a question. Sometimes you tell us reversal time coming up in 55 minutes. How do you come up with that estimation indication, especially how to know in advance? We'd be grateful for your explanation. Um, uh, it's a good question. How about that? I, it's a multitude. First of all, in this environment here, I have only uh, said that for the New York session, and for um, two or three, like when when Asia closes, when uh, the Brits are opening and when the Europeans are opening, that's the that's the five occasions where I have used that term. Obviously, it can be used for a multitude of more. And mainly I use it for the New York session. And I, I divert the New York session in three segments. And this is a little old fashioned uh, because this is not precisely anymore like this since we have no so much self-directed active players, but the principle still works in itself. How this is is, um, when I started out with this uh, 92, I guess it was, um, there was computers were just coming into play. So the percentage of self-directed traders who were working from home was very small. The majority of uh, play was done at the exchanges on the floor. Um, I was always more a fan of uh, futures because it's a more fairly plain field. And how this works is uh, there's these big guys, like big guys, uh, heavy set guys of market makers, which uh, is still nothing else than an inherited free money making. Uh, so this is basically handed down from generation to generation. Um, it's you got you got the seat in your money maker, and all you do is exactly that you make a market, and so you're basically providing liquidity. And you have a little bit of an issue at the open at the close of the market, but other than that, the principle is fairly easy. You make the market by aligning uh, sellers and buyers, and uh, you kill a spread, so it's it's there's there, there's no risk on your side, with a few exceptions, rare exceptions, and these guys can concentrate for about ninety minutes. That's it. So, if the market opens at nine, uh, at ten thirty the show is over, and they have these elaborate three and a half hour meals. So you see them leave the building. Uh, they go to super fancy restaurants, have their business meetings and mega meals, and then they come back for the last 90 minutes. So this already segments the day because what they do after the first 90 minutes, they get their system and say, okay, here, 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 here's the keyword, just don't fudge it up. Meaning uh, there's doldrums, what I call doldrums. So the middle part of the, of the, of the day, is significantly different because you have different guys making a market 
and they just provide liquidity. So this is the time when price pushes up, down, side, and 90% of the time we just have a sideways movement of a market to be made. So a complete newbie, I would already say, never trade doldrums, just trade beginning at the end of the session. And this leaves us with two 90-minute 90 segment, 90 segments that are um, significant in price behavior. They're basically substantiated. Those professionals know this obviously as well. They, they, they look for the liquidity to build and decrease uh, if you're weekly or monthly player their positions over a two or three week time period before they're fully invested. So they also look just for for average prices for fractals where it's sensible to build or decrease their positions. And a reversal time is nothing else than in that 90 segment is typically two reversals. One is the guy is coming back, takes the range over, sees where price is, and says, well, we're going sideways and now we're going down because uh, I, I'll, I'll see uh, supplant the mind zone. So it's very likely that somewhere around my time, Pacific 11.30, which market closes again one. So at the, in these last nine, 90 minutes, um, and 11.30 is reversal time. Now that does not necessarily mean that the price reverses. I, I typically mention reversal time when I think that the price will reverse. So to not be too confusing. And the next part is uh, at 12 or at 12.30. So in 30, I basically segment these, this last 90 minutes of the day. And those are the most potent ones because if I, again, if I would say to a newbie, don't trade uh, the doldrums, the next thing I would tell him, don't trade the open. Because you have a lot less, you have a lot less data at the open. So there's a lot more surprises and more skill required. So if, if I would have my four-year-old daughter to start trading, I would say, uh, don't trade on Monday, don't trade on Friday, trade Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and only trade the last 90 minutes and make reversal plays because it's the simplest, it's the simplest approach with the highest likelihood looking from a, if you're looking prosthetically through, through a time perspective to the market, not a, not a price perspective or any other perspective, but a time one only. And I don't say each time, oh, now it's 90 minutes before close, now it's 60 minutes close, now it's 30 minutes before close, and each time before I say it's reversal term. I typically try, when I use that term, to point out to, to, to you guys the, the one uh, that might be significant for your positions. So, for example, I'm not sure, like today, when I got out of ES, uh, of that uh, two-day position, it was exactly before the chatter would be coming. Uh, it, it was the, t the highest, basically. So um, I, I exits are entries, and entries are exits. So it's actually maybe even more interesting to look at where exits, because that means something for you, whatever your system is, whether you want to fade this and go in the other direction, that's fine. If you want to take partial profits, that's fine. If it's an entry for you, that's fine. But I I try to make my posts as significantly useful for you as possible. I try to post not too much, not too many markets, not too many, because there's a lot going on for me. I, I trade across markets and I trade across time frames. So I have way more trades. And I try to basically condense it down to not overwhelm posting frequency or or um, room for digesting the data and learning something. Uh, that's why I always encourage uh, somebody asking a question because I can adjust this density or or if somebody always comes up at the same time and he wants to have whatever, five, six signals, you know, rather in an hour, then, then uh, I'll, I'll focus in on that as long as we have uh, this these few subscribers only. And how can I know what each of you wants? So in short, reversal times are a higher likelihood in the first and in the last 90 minutes. 
in 30 minute intervals. And these, these of course, because I said, this is the most basic reversal technique that there is. But mine is of course fine tuned meaning you can now stack time cycles on top of this and say, well, for this instrument on that kind of day, it's always uh, not exactly at the half hour, it's like three minutes later. And uh, I have basically these statistics at my, my hands from my back testing, and they work very well. So for example, at, uh, at the close of the Asian markets, uh, 10.30 right now at this time zone, change that we lately had uh, for Pacific. Um, it's, it's, it's exactly at 22.37, at like 30 to begin with, if you want to establish an aggressive position for a reversal perspective, but typically this fades within uh, 12 uh, with seven minutes, so 10.37 and 10.42. It's these two significant times, if you just want to check these abnormalities out, uh, where you see, oh, wow, this is always when price is turning. Do I have any kind of clue why this is? No, I don't. Uh, I really don't. I just measure this uh, and uh, forward and backward this, this. But this thing is literally super solid. You just have to check it for yourself, for the instrument that you're trading. Um, that's affected by this. I mean, it's not for all instruments, but it's for precious metals. It's for um, not Bitcoin, so don't look at Bitcoin in this case. Um, uh, ES and so forth. So, um, did that answer your question? Maybe you have to be a little bit more specific, and I can give you a more precise answer. Mark says, yep, thanks, Kobe. Was right on point. Lucky me. There you go. Yeah, we've been spending a lot of time on the, the 60 and 50 minute time frame today. And I noticed that in the poll that that was actually a pretty high category. But I just wanted to comment on uh, Kobe's time cycle chart, which was, that was, that was pretty impressive. I uh, zooming out that level can really help, you know, the investor mindset think about, you know, when there could be a potential opportunity. And, and it's not just the price level, uh, which was the main point of that. Um, I, uh, how did you come up with that? I mean, where did that indicate it? I mean, what was your inspiration for that? How did that, how do you think like that? I think uh, I wrote some in the in that article, but, but obviously that's a that's a big topic. Um, I always thought it to be fascinating of uh, how much easier it was to extract uh, edges out of charts that didn't incorporate time. So after my basic, whatever, first 10 years, um, I, I gave this further thought. And then I thought, well, it made it easier, but maybe I don't, don't want easier. And I took time back in. And then I thought, started thinking through this prismatic, prismatic analysis, which is, uh, it's absolutely arbitrary that we're looking at one minute, five minute, 15, 30 hourly, four hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. I'm like, why? Why would we do that? And then obviously, yeah, okay, we have clocks and watches, and whatever, but it didn't make sense to me from a, when I started reading books about time and that we don't have an instrument to measure it, to, to, to feel it, that we only can measure it. And I, at the time, was already very certain that everything measurable was really not that attractive because uh, sciences are always limited by variables. And this has a lot of variables here, so it has scientific limitations. Uh, all, all the quants, please forgive my preconceived ideas. 
that um, at that point, I realized that most likely lots of people would be shying away. I mean, you don't have that many ways of how to look at the market. You can look from transactions. You can look from price. You can look from uh, volume. You can look from uh, time. And then you pretty pretty soon, you, you, you get into uh, derivatives already. And derivatives are always... That's just a digestion of, of an original. Why why would I not go for for the main ingredient? And um, uh, coming also from like audio engineering, where there was a lot of wave technology, where timing is very important because music is basically all about the distance of the absence of noise. That's what makes uh, music. Uh, good or bad is uh, whether people play this too fast or too short. So, for example, all the modern classical music is way too fast because uh, at the time when this was, stuff was composed, it wasn't that fast. So, great composers just take stuff a little slower. And um, the second thing that was, uh, I'm also trained as a chef. So, uh, the, the holy grail is in, in the kitchen, is basically just to just don't fudge up the produce. So the focus is all just on the ingredient and how to preserve it and how to not mess it up. So derivatives were interesting. And from that perspective on, I thought, well, maybe time is where I just had come out of a, a five-day seminar with a guy who was really cynical and who all the time just said, well, I take technical analysis and then I do exactly the opposite of that. Based on the principle you said, that's how this whole thing is built up and the edge does not exist any longer if a lot of people do the same thing. And I was like, uh, okay, that makes sense. And I was like, wow, here I spent a quarter million dollars on the education and it's all for nothing because that's all what all the other people know too. So I tapped into the most difficult part because I thought, well, from a logical perspective, if you looking at the market through whatever looking glass that is least looked at, that's where the highest potential for real edges are, that you don't get just whatever, 53 over 47 percent, but that you, whatever, you get what, what I'm doing now, which is was another guy who wrote in the book, uh, yeah, if, if you have a high hit rate and a high risk of water issue, give me a call. Also cynical of like, that's something that's not achievable because you cannot have both. You can have, either have a good hit rate or you can have a good risk of water issue. And I just, this just tickled me to like, okay, I, I don't believe that. that is, why would you make that rule? It was a little, a little difficult juvenile person anyhow, so I I challenged these things. And when you go into time, it is very difficult because you it's it's basically a market on top of a market. The market is already counterintuitive. That's why it's not a 50-50 game when you randomly start because the market triggers uh, on the stress uh, intuitive behavior. The intuitive behavior gets you into trouble because it's intuitive behavior in a counterintuitive environment it makes you 100% losing versus 50-50 outcome. And time does the same thing. Time is super counterintuitive because zero is something to measure with your instincts or with your talents of your human body. So it's all an intellectualized process. And um, these are the origins of why uh, origins of why I think that it's worthwhile doing time models. So if you're asking me how am I doing this, is I think. Uh, the best way to start out is, is just doing it. Just as you would look at a certain pattern, like last time I explained that continuation thing, and then I said to uh, one subscriber, well, and now it's your homework, find 500 of those guys uh, to gain the confidence for backtesting that this stuff is working and find it which time frames it doesn't work or with which instruments it doesn't work. So hold in on this thing. And time cycles is the same thing. Do you have that actual chart that you were referring to? By yeah, let me, let that me, everybody can see it. Let me grab it. 
So uh, to come to a result like the one I presented uh, is obviously not try and error because uh, I uh, I dissected uh, okay this is brain warp one second I cannot look at what's happening and talk at the same time um, uh, there was a I have methodologies now that make it easier for me to extract time cycles. And it's not making a lot of sense to try to iterate this because that's mainly computer stuff that helps me measure the stuff and then lay it over and over and over. But I think the most convincing aspect um, is that chart that I said, and I was very surprised that I'm always begging for these uh, uh, questions that nobody had a question to it because I gave in this case a very, a very valuable chart I thought because uh, what this thing showed was a flawless back record meaning um, you want me to look for that picture because I kind of need it for the next thought that I have in my head Give us one second, guys. Yes, I found the picture, but not the, the text. It's, it's somewhere in the red chat. Don't need the text. We just need the picture. Yeah, here we go. I'm babbling much, plenty enough. Okay. So, uh, quick recoup just to make sure that everybody follows. We have these half moons on top, and this is the time circle. Each of these half moons is the same distance, so there's no fudging going on. And then I made these radical lines that go down to price. Then we have two groups uh, where price is either at a low or at a high. And I didn't adjust this. I could have done this too to, to, to give basically a, the next secret socks away, which is we're living in an expanding universe. So time isn't linear as it's always believed in. This is why we also have these adjustments of, for the years. Um, and the further a time cycle expands, the, the further you have to move it. So you see within here, uh, no contraction and expansion cycle adjustments, meaning this is literally hardcore, straight out, the same distance on top. But it should be some contracting, some expanding, some contracting, some expanding. And this is why sometimes it's off by one bar, but it's literally only off by one, by maximum one bar which is really not important because you're still at the high, you can identify at the time. And what should have tickled everybody a little bit uh, and what only Matthew is, there is no false. Every of these cycles, it basically says with this kind of distance, and you can measure the distance uh, on the bottom, uh, if you apply to the first higher to the first low, you will get a sequence where at, at the specific distance of time, you get a significant event. Now, you, there is no logic to, no rhythmical logic uh, uh, to, to highs and lows. So we have here twice in the middle part, uh, low, two highs, low, two highs, and this is reflected with breaks in between as the more dominant cycle as well. But mainly this edge just says, look at that next time. So if you're looking to the very right, uh, in about a third of that cycle length comes basically the next vertical line. And you have a, basically a high likelihood, something to be happening. Mm. If, if you think about all, all these interviews and all that stuff that you're, then, then you're listening to it, and the interviewer always just says, so how do you see the next uh, race or whatever? How do you see uh, where will Bitcoin be at such and such? Well, with an edge like this, who cares about the price? Do you care about the price, whether it's at 100,000, 200,000, or 300,000? Or would you rather like, like to know that in exactly five months from now, uh, Bitcoin will be higher. 
And that's basically what's being said here because the rest you can figure out with your classical TA what's more likely of highs or lows. But uh, if you know, you don't have to pay attention because it takes another seven months before we even at a significant point of entry or exit. Yeah, well, you, you know, all in brackets, you know all your entries and all your exits. So what's very valuable is to know this stuff is, and this is what this chart showing because it's a sample size of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, I did this on weekly because you find this stuff a lot easier, obviously, on on the smaller time frames because the smaller time frames they're already like regimented by open and closing from an exchange. I made clear that everybody realizes well time cycles work even on weekly or monthly. And then it should be like, it should it should really rock your boat if you're not working with time yet, because um, this is the super risk eliminator because money exposed is money at risk. Um, and it, it, this thing basically shows you, well, there's a time when to trade, and there's a time when not to trade on, on weekly for that specific instrument for whatever the specific time segment. So um, that's for the part of why it's valuable, where it's coming from, why I spent, and this is basically, this is the, this is the big part, it's a very big part in my trading is, is this. I'm not saying that this necessarily is for early stage traders, uh, something that we should work on right away, but um, uh, it's important to, what was devastating with me not having mentorship is how much time I wasted looking at corners that were absolutely nonsensical. Where I just spent forever fine tuning entries in, in the first years uh, until I realized that exits are so much more important and that it took a lot longer to to get to a quad exit, which would have helped me in the, in the early in the earlier so so much more. So um, did, did, uh, did that in part answer your question or were you what yes. was specific? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. What you can also see on this thing is cycles really well. They always speak about the cyclical stuff and that they have their weird one thing of which is a year. The market doesn't care whether it's January or February. It really doesn't. I mean, with the exception if you trade orange juice or wheat, that's weather dependent. But not everything is weather dependent, but that doesn't mean that there's not absolutely cycles, super cycles, macro, micro cycles in all of these instruments that are time relative. Um, but it's just not as simple as just to say, oh, well, uh, whatever, like a reversal point. This guy comes in in the morning, then he trades for 90 minutes. And, yeah, that makes sense. That's intuitive. But everybody can figure that out and you have no edge anymore. Um, but if you if you focus on cycles that are specific to time frame and an instrument, you have a real valuable item that that not that many people have and in, in regards to figuring this out is it's a tried error. I started literally just like take this, take this tool, take there's various tools that you can use and just fumble around. And then you and then if you have that overlay and it, it does fit the Bitcoin annual cycle as well, then you have a verification. You can say, okay, I, I put some money on this thing because I see this for the last uh, six years on Bitcoin working. But if just somebody else says, well, we have these time cycles and um, I mean, if you have a process of halving, it, it makes sense. But there's so much talk about time that is absolutely, excuse my language, it's just BS. It really is. It's just people naming things to have something named after them. But you know, you ask him to put a chart in the back testing and, and whatever the living is, it's just, I don't know. See, that's that's the big thing in trading is that I don't know. Well, most of these people that we, we see, are, I mean, either we have the super academic idiots who, who print the money who don't have a clue about this whole thing, 
and, and then pretty quickly comes uh, interviewers or whatever. Their first, it's a good looking girl who just, she started out at some TV show that then she is not 30 any longer, but 40. And then she, she opens the channel and makes another thing. So they don't have a clue either. And then the interviews, the non-spot non interviewers pick themselves, the guys at the interview, yeah, well, how much clue do they have? That this is all just guys who promote their companies and uh, these are networking people. So this is, uh, again, 6310, uh, a brand networking product. So that in the 10, there's not much going on. Um, but that's the advantage of if you being a trainer, you're self-directed, you don't have to have uh, networking for building your company, and you, you can spend uh, the rest of your life <laughs> in the cellar backtesting like what I do. It's also not for everybody, um, but I am I am that kind of weird nerd who, who just like, uh, actually, for example, I look at the chart, love the chart, it's just a great... For me, this is art when I look at this thing. I'm like, oh, okay, here are all the tops. And, oh, they're all measured by that same cycle. And, oh, 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 this looks good. It, it's like, it's for me, this is fun, but this is great. This is exciting because uh, your egos get triggered where you're like, oh, I can predict the future. But obviously, all just statistical edges, and it's not that way, but it, it can be for some a very enticing way of spending one's time. Yeah, a sec, you say, are the half circles drawn by yourself or can you tell no. us? The uh, let me look up what this is called. Because <clears throat> I don't, I just use the stuff I, I never have. There's so many tools that I'm using. It's, I use Trading View and you will find, uh, one second, please. Uh, I have to quick check because I I use uh, self-programmed stuff as well and I don't want to lie to you what this is in this case. So I need to double check. Um, so I have to find the chart myself. No, this is, this is the one from... Um, and I make a screenshot and I put that screenshot in the blue room. Uh, and I have done so now. So if you look for a second onto your screen, then you will find um, it's the two, four, six, a uh, choice of drawing tool from the top from your menu. And then within that six in the sub menu, it's the second to last and it's called time cycles. You see a few other ones that are available there, but this specific one that you see in this specific chart is you is drawn with time cycles. Uh, it's these two wobbly loops that make us Second screenshot. And without the branding. So this is how this looks like and it's called. It's this two loopy loops uh, under, under called time cycles and uh, is this called something? No. <clears throat> Uh, in, in in the two four in the six drawing tool that starts with A B C D patterns. Did that? Did you have to go back to? Did you yeah. find it? Yeah, he said he has it. He says awesome. Good, good. So no no secret tool usage. No, this is this is really really just need to know. And this yeah. is. This is what it all is. When you guys subscribe and you pay whatever you pay because we have these different uh, specials, uh, so I don't know what everybody pays per month. 
you might think, oh yeah, well, we'll have to pay her for her. Is that really worth it? Everything else is for free. Um, and then there's nothing fancy coming on. I mean, what's coming fancy is that probably some scratch their heads and say, why is this guy all the time in real time hitting these entry and exit so well? But besides that, it it I I spend a lot of time to reduce the findings that way that they're easily understandable from a language perspective and applicable. But the process behind this to have even just found the questions to the obstacles that I encountered and then extract the answers to those and find the solutions in principle of how to overcome this and then transfer this back into a principle that is applicable to more than just one incident, make a rule out of it, test it back with the former test and then tell you, it makes it appear that uh, yeah, here's his little philosophical text again and here's his little uh, kindergarten rule again, sounds all really easy, whatever, but that's not the case. It really isn't the case. This is This is me for 30 years uh, with other people who at times who, who are way smarter than I am consistently every day 18 hours I have not had a life I literally this is the only thing that I did I mean I did something prior to engaging in this and that's why I have a little bit of clue of the other fields but since then that's it so the advantage of getting out of this is it sounds easy when you just copy and do it, but it's a lot of difficult, more difficult to, to just try and error because with try and error, a lot of time goes by, a lot of a lot of hardship goes by. And that is my main intent. And it's not a altruistic one, it's a selfish one. The reason why I speak, the reason why uh, Matthew has invited me to to be part of his company and me posting in the red channel is that there was so much obstacles and so much, so many tears and more than just tears of uh, of just a really bad time because I was about to lose my mind because I didn't realize I didn't know what counterintuitive meant and that you're fighting against the fight flight mechanism and that you all of these things basically were just work that, that was generated and um, I didn't I didn't I mean I'm quoting people and I have I've, I've been to a lot of courses and I read a lot of books but but there's a lot of uh, there was a very high amount of uh, benefits that you're getting out of this that that you cannot find in the book and most of all not in a sequence that it's applicable and that that you can ask somebody. This is why all the time just say, guys, you have to ask your stuff because I know that you're sitting there and that you're frustrated because it's not working. That doesn't make it shameable to not ask. That doesn't make it... Uh, that's everybody it's for everybody like this. I, I, I coached a lot of people and they all basically had the same problems, which is losing my shirt all the time and I'm losing my mind. That's the two things. Can you please help me to like stop the bleeding or, or, or stop the pain? And it's very polite, of course, to 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 not interrupt what we're teaching and, uh, and, and our training because Matt and I train to, for real and real time. And, um, but but we're here. We're here for you guys, and we 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 want you to have a better life quality because it's it's training is really 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 hard and um, it's only it's only human to try to reduce that self-induced pain um, and as I said it's an altruistic for me for me it's I have a very empathetic uh, mental makeup I, I, I basically need to share need to learn also from your questions for the fact that my own uh, that I'm balanced as a human being, feeling not guilty to sit on the gold pot myself, and uh, uh, to have a, 
a conclusive mindset for execution uh, that has to do with uh, little self-worth and whatever else. So we all, all of these things you need to be working on too. How do you allocate your time with whom to spend and what to do, how much social, how much um, it has to be very, very balanced to be a good uh, trade, be a good trade execution. Um, yeah, I was a little getting Thank a little you. off track here. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for explaining that because, you know, this, this chart would be very helpful to you know, the long-term investor that's thinking about maybe, you know, dollar cost averaging in or whatnot. And, uh, but thank you. So um, it's a holiday tomorrow. Uh, yep. Thanks to you too. Thanks, Mark, for coming out. It's going to be holiday tomorrow, right? Thanksgiving. So I don't think we're going to be active in the room. Um, usually not a good idea to trade even Bitcoin on a holiday. So uh, no daily calls tonight, right, Corby? Uh, no daily calls, as I wrote on the list, uh, a little holiday sign. Okay. Um, I will obviously, because I do, for me, there is no holidays. I'm just, I'm a trader. So if there is somebody there who, whatever, is bored or the turkey have, hasn't fall, put him to sleep yet, they can always ask a question. But officially, we're closed. Nobody, nobody of the team has to show up and uh, everybody's allowed to the slice of turkey and the peace of mind so you will not there will be no postings you will not miss anything uh, in real time and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little back testing session over the next four days planned so um, I'll still be here if somebody has an urgent question all right well sounds great thanks for coming out guys um, have a great holiday happy Thanksgiving and uh, we'll see you guys in the room take care Happy Thanksgiving. Adios.